This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Case IH. Coming up on this weekend's broadcast, looking into 2023, the farm economy could have a tough act to follow after the past two years. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this weekend's broadcast. Mike Pearson is outside of the studio this weekend. We're pleased to be able to join you once more to share the agriculture story here in the next few minutes. Yeah, we're looking at the year ahead, and the CoBank economists have been doing that, too. And Rob Fox, who is a director of CoBank's Knowledge Exchange, joins us this weekend. I was looking through the 29 pages of that report, Rob. It's jam-packed with information. And I guess the thing that caught my attention right at the outset, it's a little bit pessimistic. Well, you know, Max, it's tough to... Um to paint the picture after the past couple of years, which have really been outstanding in terms of profitability for, uh, you know, row crops and, and for the most part, livestock producers, even dairy industries gotten into it. So coming off of, of consecutive record uh, net incomes for the U.S. farm sector, um, it's tough to, when things kind of get back to normal, it's tough to, to paint the picture that doesn't sound a little bit negative, but we want to be, we want to raise the warning flag a little bit to, to our customers and other interested parties that, hey, the, this party was great while it lasted, but things are going to ease off a little bit in 2023. So just prepare yourself for it's not going to be terrible, right? There's still a lot of things supporting the ag economy uh, decently, right? But uh, um, just don't get used to what we've had the past couple of years. Well, it appears looming not too far over the horizon is recession. We're barreling down the tracks toward that. Almost all of the economists believe that there's a good possibility for that. You think it's a second quarter event, right? Yeah, I mean, second, third quarter, and I think it, it won't be a, a devastating recession. Um, and, you know, most economists think that maybe fourth quarter that, you know, we'll, we'll pull back out of it. You know, it's going to be somewhat analogous to a soft landing, but we may dip into a recession a little bit. And, you know, agriculture in general holds up pretty well because people need to eat, obviously. But this is going to be a worldwide slowdown with um, Europe and China slowing down noticeably, you know, worse than, than we are. So, um, things take, uh, you know, consumers across the world, they do, you know, unlike in the United States where we pretty much chug along and, and eat our uh, hamburgers and wings and so forth, uh, almost regardless of, of economic conditions, you know, the rest of the world does feel that uh, income pinch and, and we always see a slowdown in, in particularly uh, protein exports and, and dairy exports. The headline of the section that you authored in the report said farm margins under pressure. What would be the biggest factor, as you see it, that will drive margins lower? Well, it's it, it has to do with across the board co uh, cost increases versus last year at this time. Um, think about a year ago today, I mean, this is pre the Ukraine invasion pre the huge uh, fertilizer uh, spike that we we saw right around this time last year. So the bottom line is that crops are being planted. The 2023 crops are being planted with a whole new cost structure relative than the 2022 crops were planted. So uh, across the board, we calculate it's about 25 to 30 percent higher cost structure for the coming year's uh, growing season. And then on and the, then, I'm sorry. You, know, you look at, you look at the uh, uh, crop prices are still pretty solid, right? But they're coming down a little bit, you know, instead of $7-ish corn, we're probably looking at $6-ish corn for late 2023. So you pencil it out today and that's where you get kind of that margin compression. And, you know, I still think things will be in the, in the black, right? But, um, uh, definitely not like what we saw the past couple years. I noted in the report there was a comment about China buying from us only if they have to. Now that's that's significant, isn't it? Since they're such a huge customer of ours. Well, obviously they are our largest ex, uh, ag export customer. 
and it's across the board a lot of things uh, uh, soybeans animal proteins the past couple of years corn big buyer of corn and I don't know if you follow kind of the geopolitical situation with with China it's been rocky a relationship with us over the past five years and it's almost getting more heated at the moment with uh, saber rattling regarding Taiwan and and almost daily news about uh, the U.S. Uh, banning the importation of, of certain high-tech items from China, um, uh, difficulties with their, you know, social media networks and so on. So things from a trade and political standpoint have, are really at a, you know, decades-long low. So China will push every political button they can to figure out how to irritate us and obviously uh, you know farm farm economy is one sensitive area of course and then china is going to look for every possible alternative uh market rather than buy from the u.s but you know they'll, there's just not enough you know corn and soybeans and so forth to go around so they do have to depend on us uh, somewhat Rob, thank you for your analysis, sharing it with us this weekend. We appreciate the work that you folks do at CoBank. There's a lot of good research coming out of there. I will link on my personal Twitter account at Max Armstrong that 29-page report so folks can take a look at it. Have a great holiday season, Rob. Thank you. Thanks. Much appreciated, Max. You too and all the, the family you got over there. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone Ag. The Firestone Ag dealer network offers you the support, inventory, and resources you need. Visit FirestoneAg.com to find your local certified dealer. It's a pleasure to visit this weekend with Walter Kunish of HTS Commodities. Walter, good to see you. Thanks for being here with us. Morning. Thank you for having me today. As we look across the landscape here, the, you know, I always think about this uh, time of the year as we get into the holidays, we start watching a little closer what's going on in South America. How bad is the situation in Argentina? Put that in perspective in terms of total South American crop production. Total South American crop production is kind of a tale of two stories right now. As you mentioned, you know, Argentina is definitely dry, drier than the martini that I had last week at my holiday party. And that's negatively impacting both their winter wheat, corn and soybean production. But fortunately, I mean, weather in, in the southern hemisphere, it's very visible. It's a slow moving input variable. And while the world is expecting a shortfall in the Argentina on um, 22-23 winter wheat crop, we're also expecting that too to translate over to a compressed corn, you know, corn production. But at the same time, as I mentioned, I have a tale of two stories. Brazil is actually seeing some beneficial rains. And it, while the crop is still you know, still being, you know, still being, uh, you know, still being produced, still being planted. Um, you know, we still think that there's room to make these crops. However, though, you know, we would expect some, uh, you know, perhaps some weakening in production estimates over the next couple of weeks. I think some folks felt that that Argentine corn estimate in the supply and demand report a few days ago was a little bit uh, uh, maybe overestimated that maybe that crop is going to wind up being smaller but i guess you have to put it in perspective of the the 600 pound gorilla next door don't you in terms of brazil production you know ab absolutely and you know it's not just the wazi report isn't about just latin america of course you know the usda is going to be very methodical in their treatment of the south american production but also about the south american demand as well that's for corn uh, soybeans and wheat. But what was really interesting, we were looking out of at the um, at, out of the WASDE report, is really the treatment of the U.S. corn balance sheet, U.S. in treatment of U.S. Bean, uh, soybean balance sheet. The corn balance sheet in particular right now looks very vulnerable. Demand is being challenged in the U.S. The USDA continues to to decrease demand, which is increasing the carryout. And right now, you know, when we look at the global corn paradigm, the global corn supply and demand, I think from the U.S. side, it's a little bit more vulnerable or suspect to increasing carryout and price softness moving ahead than perhaps, you know, the, some of the supply shortfalls in, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. Share with us an update, if you would, on the river situation and uh, what's happening there. That basis has uh, dropped quite a bit, has it not? That basis has fallen like a rock, and rightfully so. You know, I think when we you know we look at what's going on at the you know with the river, um, there still is a trickle of U.S. exports out of the Gulf, and the weekly 
weekly USDA export sales numbers tell the whole story. The U.S. is just, you know, combining a strong dollar, you know, uh, logistical challenges on the river. It's not, ex, you know, we're not winning US, uh, corn export business in the, in the world markets right now. So, you know, I think we're all looking forward to the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, hopefully opening up the river a little bit to kind of get corn moving out, help basis, help cash prices. But, you know, it's unfortunately, it's been a slow trickle. Walter, we'll come back to you in just a moment. Stand by there if you want. Walter Kunish from HTS Commodities with us this weekend on This Week in Agribusiness. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone Ag. Harvey Firestone invented the first pneumatic farm tire, forever changing what it means to farm hard. Visit firestoneag.com to learn more about this history and tire solutions for today. We want to learn more about the market world from Walter Kunish with HTS Commodities. Walter, when we see big winter storms coming through, we realize they can have a lot of impact, especially on the livestock sector. We may lose some cattle out there. We get mud in feedlots. Marketings uh, get disrupted. How do you analyze this situation in the days ahead? You know, those are great, you know, great, yeah, it's great assessment on what we're looking at to come. And I think, you know, the cattle business has been, you know, has been, um, you know, very, the cash cattle markets have been very supportive over the last few weeks. And, it, you know, perhaps, you know, these winter storms rolling through can only, you know, can only add to those cash prices. I mean, obviously that has yet to, you know, remains to be seen, but, you know, you're absolutely right. When we add cold weather, increased mud on cattle, the increased uh, probability of death loss in a packer who's just short bought, that you know, kind of creates a combustible, a combustible mixture that can you know create a positive uh, benefit for the feedlots. What do you see on the demand side for beef right now? You know, uh, profile story this week: uh, inflation. Uh, well, it's still there; it's just not running up as fast as it was. But there was a lot of attention given to it in the media. Uh, does that maybe make the consumer feel any better about uh, spending on beef? Well, this consumer is tired of spending money, and beef is at astronomical prices. And I think what we're seeing right now is a rotation in, in beef demand. The cutout has been, you know, maintaining its has kind of been maintaining its sideways, moving sideways. But packer margins have continued to plummet. And the reason that packer margins have continued to plummet is a changing of demand. The rib values right now are holding up the entire cutout value, and that you know that should last through the holidays. But loins are displaying weakness. So are short plate. Short plate is a is a primarily an exportable primal. So I think when we look at you know inflation and just for right now, beef on a relative basis compared to pork is very expensive. And as supplies tracked, as cattle supplies contract, as the expansion begins, and female animals are retained, I think we can all I think we can look forward to higher beef prices throughout 2023 and into 2024. So on into uh, not just the new year, but the one following it, huh? Regrettably, yes. Crude oil. We've seen uh, some recovery there. Some of it related, I guess, to the pipeline incident. They're not far from the Kansas-Nebraska state line. What do you see there? How long lasting will that be? You know, it's yet to be determined. It seems like there, you know, there are signals that um, you know, that, that, you know, the pipeline is being, you know, the problems are, are being contained. But really, I think we kind of look at, you know, crude oil. You know, crude oil has been more reflective of the global economy. It seems like crude oil is higher one week on the prospect that China will open. Crude oil is lower next week on the prospect that your U.S. Uh, that U.S. Uh, economy is weakening. But I think looking ahead into 2000, 2023, you know, we could see a resurgence in diesel prices. De global diesel demand should continue to be robust, particularly as Russia stops exporting. The U.S. will no longer, in Europe, will no longer take Russian exports. So that can translate to higher diesel prices or constant diesel prices out in the country. And that translates into food inflation, too, as we have diesel at every step of the way to get that uh, food to our tables. Walter Kunish, thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great weekend. You too, sir. Happy holidays to you. Walter Kunish from HTS Commodities with us this weekend on This Week in Agribusiness. Chad Colby's look at agriculture technology comes your way next, brought to you by the IBM Watson Decision Platform. Combining AI with Internet of Things data to help agribusiness increase yields, improve quality, and drive sustainability. Well, we rely on this guy the year round to bring us information from the technology sector. Quite often it's drone related, as you've noticed. Many of you have learned about those unmanned aircraft through his assistance. But Chad Colby weighs in this weekend. We know he's been on the road speaking at a meeting somewhere. I love talking about technology and there's not a better place to do it this past week, 
other than Central Indiana. With me is Eric Pfeiffer from, let me get the title right, uh, who's your ag today? You got it. I got it. Great farm show this past week we attended. Let's talk a little bit about some of the technology that was on display here. Sold out, good crowds, largely because of the weather. Talk a little bit about some of that technology, Eric. Well, we really wanted to make technology the focus of this show. That's why we renamed it when we took it over about four years ago, the Indiana Farm Equipment and Technology Expo. Yes, there's equipment out here, but technology has been the focus. But we've also been talking with the folks at Intellinair. They've been talking about their Ag MRI product and things that they can get from drone imagery. We had high schoolers here yesterday talking about some of the precision ag things that they're learning uh, in, in what they're doing for their vocation here in high school. A lot of really neat things around the floor. We've got drones, a big spray drone down there that's really been a hot topic of conversation for a lot of our attendees. Talk a little bit about some of the, the supporters of the show. There's a lot of big iron here too. I see some green, I see some red. Talk a little bit about what that means to a show like this. It's fantastic having these local companies on board with us, a local company. Who's Your Ag Today is owned in Indiana. We are Indiana based and we love having this opportunity to meet with our, our farmer listeners and really we get great support from the folks like Reynolds Farm Equipment, a John Deere dealer here in central Indiana. They've been fantastic to work with. They brought in their new X9 Combine. Uh, they also brought in a flex draper, the uh, sprayer this, this week. I mean, they've got all sorts of stuff down here, a lot of green right in the middle of the floor, and they've been a big supporter of our show. You know, walking around these shows for me, I love seeing all the attachments. So many people invest a lot of time and effort in making their planter work better, maybe some great attachments for their corn head. And there's no shortage of that at this show. And especially guys have to plan a little bit more because of you know, getting the product in time. It may be not in time for spring of 23. They're making decisions already for 24 and regional shows like this give guys a chance to do that. That's, That's what right. we're trying to do here. Farmers need to come. They need to talk with each other about plans that they have, how some of those things might meld, what, what types of ideas they have. And then they get to talk with the experts that are here in the room and they get to figure out what's really important to them. That's why we do this show. That's a great thing about events just like this. Uh, thank you much, Chad. We appreciate it. I'm sure Chad will be out there on the speaking circuit a lot of meetings over the next few weeks as his information is in demand. But we're pleased to share his insight right here each weekend. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. Farm organizations aren't sure what the landscape will look like on Capitol Hill when they get out there in the new year. They do know, though, this was a busy year for some of the groups, such as the cattle industry organizations. Mike shares with us a visit on that this weekend. That's right, Max. We've seen a lot of attention from Washington, D.C. on the cattle market. Wanted to get an update on how this past year went, wins and losses for the cattle industry. Joining us now is Tanner Beamer. He's the Senior Director of Government Affairs at the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. And Tanner, this was a busy year from the government perspective, wasn't it? Holy smokes. You know, I think uh, over the course of the 117th Congress, we may have had congressional hearings on cattle markets about seven different times between both chambers and different committees of jurisdiction. So it has been an active Congress on this issue, to say the least. And Tanner, put that into perspective for our audience. We had seven or more hearings on the cattle market. How does that compare to years past? Do we get one or two in a given year? Uh in my experience, we've only gotten about one, and that's typically at the beginning of a new Congress where they will hold what they call a state of the livestock economy hearing. And that's not cattle market specific. That is all livestock sectors. So it was a very unique thing. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with the disruptions we saw in our market from the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the Holcomb fire. Uh, and I think you've seen Congress take a, a very keen interest in the consolidated nature at the packing sector and try and really piece together what impacts, if any, that has on the fed cattle market. So there, there's been a lot of factors that have influenced that, but uh, definitely more than is typical in any given congressional cycle. That's true. And given all that interest, given the enthusiasm for the beef markets in Washington, DC, Tanner, the industry was able to notch up a couple of wins. What were some of the things this past year you were excited to see? Well, even from a non-policy perspective, I think watching the marketplace recover from those supply chain disruptions from COVID-19 has been very encouraging. You know, as of as of yesterday, the December fat cattle contract was trading at about 154.90, 100 weight, 
which is a significant improvement from where it was last year. And a lot of that has been the market doing what markets do. They cycle, they boom, they bust, and they recover. Uh, and that is now putting some more money into cattle producers' pockets. But on the policy side, we did see a pretty big victory in an announcement from USDA that they are going to be moving forward with a cattle contract library in pilot form. So that's important for a couple reasons. One, uh, Senator Hoven, who's a, an appropriator uh, in the Senate, uh, made sure that there was some money set aside for this pilot program. And then USDA engaged with stakeholders to see how they should go about teeing up that uh, contract library. And we're pretty, pretty pleased with the result that we've seen uh, in the form of a final rule out of USDA. Sometime in January, we're going to get to see the library play around with it and see what that does in terms of market transparency and providing information to the marketplace. Uh, and we'll have some other opportunities to provide feedback based upon what we see then. Now, Tanner, the contract library concept has existed in the hog industry for, for quite a while. It's new to the cattle market. How do you anticipate cattle producers using this tool? You bet. So it's designed to be a market transparency tool and nothing else. It is designed to allow producers to go and see what types of contract terms are being offered from packers to feeders for the procurement of fed cattle. And that's important because a lot of the uh, programs that those cattle can be enrolled in and a lot of the production practices that lead to higher quality beef are actually implemented at the cow-calf sector and as a stalker. And so if you're able to go in and take a look at what some of those terms are, maybe you are already doing some things on your ranch and you need to just enroll in a program in order to access some of these uh, premiums that are available in the marketplace. This library is designed to be a tool to allow producers to see what the options are available to them because information is power when it comes to market negotiations. And we're trying to put some more information out there for the benefit of cattle producers. So Cattle Contract Library pilot program is a win. Tanner, on the legislative or regulatory side, any other victories this past year? You know, we have just seen, uh, like I said, a lot of interest in not just the Cattle Contracts Library, but other market transparency tools. USDA has put out some additional uh, reports under livestock mandatory reporting. They've done that about a year and a half ago is when they started publishing some of those new ones. But what we have been able to kind of see in the time elapsing since then is just how useful that information is when you compare between the transaction types, whether it's negotiated cash or a grid or some sort of a formula or a forward contract. That's another thing that just allows producers to kind of see what their options are in order for them to make the best business decisions for their individual business operation to capture the most value for their livestock. That makes sense, Tanner. Looking out to what is coming in this new year, we also saw some challenges here in this past year. What's ahead for the cattle market? Well, first and foremost, we have to deal with a farm bill. Uh, it is that once every five year period where everyone in Washington and the ag circles is talking about what's going to happen in the farm bill. For NCBA, I think one of our top priorities is going to be uh, in securing access to risk management. Because while cattle prices have improved, it is still inherently a volatile market. Our, our producers across the country are dealing with drought in some form or fashion, uh, which creates significant risk management headaches. Uh, not to mention the fact that, you know, the, some of these risk management tools are going to be very, very critical for producers uh, just to hedge against price risk. And so we're going to be making sure that some of those programs like the Livestock Risk Protection Program, the Pasture Range and Forage Program are safeguarded as part of this farm bill, uh, in addition to some of our other priorities in the conservation title and the animal disease preparation space. It's a good reminder to stay active this next year with that farm bill discussion coming up, isn't it, Tanner? Absolutely. You know, and I think what's as, as important to talk about is what we don't want to see, and that is a livestock title in the farm bill. Lots to discuss this next year. Tanner Bamer, Senior Director of Government Affairs at NCBA. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Mike. Oh, I'm sure we'll get an update of the Cattlemen's Convention. That's not too many weeks into the new year. February 1st through the 3rd, New Orleans, Louisiana. There's more coming up here. Stay with us. This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Case IH. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. Well, we've been spending quite a bit of time in one of our favorite states in America, Missouri. We'll talk a little bit later on about our Christmas broadcast originating from Southeast Missouri next weekend. But a few weeks back, we were in the Northeast part of the state. The town of Shelbina, population about 1,700 out south of town there, we visited for our Plan Smart Grow Smart series with Brian Threlkeld.
What's your uh, approach to weed control? I mean, there are some guys who say, I don't want to see a single solitary weed out there. Others have a varying level of tolerance for weeds and they'll put up with a few. Where are you on that well, scale? I would say I don't like any weeds. It depends on the weed. I would rather have no weeds because you know, you're just scattering seed for generations down the road and trying to take care of it now. So maybe the next generation don't have to. Do you have any resistance challenge, weed resistance challenges here? Water hemp resistance, uh, which is a challenge for us. Uh, seems like we, we fight that more and more on the water hemp side. Uh, that's kind of the only weed that we really fight really bad. What's your plan for controlling it? Does it vary year to year or do you kind of adhere to the, the same approach? It, it kind of varies, but uh, you know, in the last couple of years, we've been using the Zidual Pro down on a burn down or a Zidual SC and that Zidual product is what seems to control water hemp the best in our operation. And so, you know, the main thing you hear is the easiest weed to kill is the one that's not there. So we started putting the residual down at a full rate and uh, it seemed like it was working. And so we just, every year, we just kind of do a little more and more every year with that product. And we use Armazon Pro on the corn, which we've been going early post, you know, six to eight inches tall. And we haven't had hardly any resprays on that. And you know, you can get that clean field, and then if that corn's growing right, that canopy comes up and it's canopied and you're home free. It's hard to beat that, isn't hard it? Hard to beat that, yeah. Everybody's wanting you to two-pass the corn, and I don't like that because I just ain't got time to get over all those acres and, and do all that. So we started using Armazon Pro, early post, six, eight inches tall corn, and uh, it seems like that's been working so far the best for me. It's a one-shot deal, put some atrazine with it, Armazon Pro little bit of Roundup, clean it up, corn's growing, canopies, you're usually done. You don't have to worry about it. And our fields are clean. We take you any field we got today and they're, they're clean. And you feel like you're really getting a, a good return on your investment good there too? Good return on investment. The hardest part is just waiting for that corn to get to six to eight inches tall, you know, because there's some days you could be spraying it when it wasn't out of the ground. But for me, it's just like you gotta wait, you gotta do it right. It's, it's all about timing when you're spraying anymore. When you're in harvest, when you're rolling across the fields, are you already thinking what I'm going to do in these various uh, parcels that we farm? I do, yes. Uh, you got to have a game plan for the next year. And, and I don't always put all my eggs in one basket as far as chemistry. I like to mix it up a little bit. And just in case one doesn't work, you ain't got it on all them acres. You got, you know, a, a variance. Talk about the future of your farm here. What do you see going down the road? I look forward to every year and everything. and. I know we're going to be here. We're going to keep growing. I got two sons coming behind me. One is uh, 25, the other is 13, and my oldest son farms with me every day, uh, side to side, and I see him every day. So can't be nothing special other than that. Yeah, I'd say it's hard to beat that, all right. We enjoyed the visit very much with Brian Throwkow there at Shelbina. Missouri. You can see more and you can see other episodes of Plan Smart, Grow Smart at the website plansmartgrowsmart.com. Greg Solier now brings us his farm weather forecast for the week ahead, presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. Well, credit where credit is due. This guy was telling us weeks ago that we'd have an abrupt switch into wintry weather here in the month of December. You called that one right, pal. Well, Max, yeah, we hit the nail on the head weather-wise on last week's show about that big, bad blizzard and, boy, that multi-day snow event that played out across the Divide country into the Dakotas, southern Canadian prairie, and even preceding that storm, there was already a foot of snow on the ground. So you wanted drought relief, uh, the old trickle-down effect with time, but, but certainly a tough go of it with livestock operations in mind. If you thought last week was tough, just wait till this week and over a wide area of the country uh, it is a cold wave weather pattern there where we've let that cat out of the bag for you. And here's the leading edge of it through big sky country. Remember these cold air masses like to migrate where there's cold soaked or snow covered grounds. Plenty of it through Montana, plenty of it across the Canadian Prairie and the Dakotas. And note the sizable upper air trough and another quick round of uh, light accumulating snowfall, low moisture content. Uh, but it is what it is. Dress and plan in terms of uh, perhaps a mid-January or mid-winter look and feel. We'll get that with Arctic high pressure. 
pressure, sub-zero cold at night, struggling to get past a zero by day right along the Canadian border throughout the Dakotas and points on northward. The last of this weather system kind of pulling on through and we'll get a myriad of these little clippers running the periphery of cold wave weather here and cold through northern California. Probably some of that cold again, much like last week expected to build all the way down into parts of the San Joaquin and Imperial Valley. Probably another multi day frost and freeze event expected there. Here's this a leading edge of cold air, a dash of a little bit of moisture. Yeah, more severe weather last week out of the southern plains. Not much of it this week, but here comes the cold uh, building into the four corners valleys of California. Uh, some snow across the front range of the Rockies into parts of the plain states with another little clipper system. Yeah, nighttime readings will be down below zero where some of those winter wheat fields of the Great Plains and heading southward into the Red River Valley of the south. The Red River Valley of the north, you're digging out still from last week's storm. Here is the leading edge of this uh, cold wave weather pattern, which will uh, ensconce much of the heartland. Seasonal cold across the southern Great Lakes region, some snow shower flu activity across the Great Lakes region. Note how the jet stream buckles here, a northwest flow. It's a clipper system moving on through, and we'll get the propensity of uh, systems in uh, fast moving nature, light snow amounts, but a myriad of these systems as they run the periphery of the Arctic cold, sub zero cold, probably at least into the central and west central corn belt, and some snow shower flu activity will wipe the ground over, getting it ready for St. Nick and Christmas here. Going to be a white Christmas over many areas of the Corn Belt and the Plain States region, too. Here's that cold front through the panhandle of Oklahoma and Texas. Some snow shower and flurry activity in through New Mexico. Nice to have the snows last week through Colorado, all the way down through New Mexico. Unfortunately, it was fraught with severe weather with cleanup and recovery underway across the Delta region and lower Mississippi Valley. Later in the week, that cold air settles on into West Texas cotton, northward into the Plain States region. Heads up livestock managers. Slightly milder air, but a chilly rain system moving on through the lower Mississippi Valley. A couple of sprinkles and snowflakes as far north as the Ohio River Valley. Into the Corn Belt we go. We've had a pretty good respite of winter weather. Not much of it into the eastern and southern areas. The rains last week of great benefit to these dry, drought-ridden areas over the eastern and southern Corn Belt. But here comes the cold. Here comes the snow as well. And some leftover snow shower and flu activity. This is last week's storm that hit the plains, still lingering over parts of southeastern Canada. That cold air and the cold wave weather pattern builds into the northern and western Corn Belt later in the week. It will be a frigid one for the Christmas holiday and a white Christmas for many throughout the Corn Belt as well. Some accumulation expected. A rain snow mix line the leading edge of the cold air into the Ohio Valley. A pretty quiet weather picture here late in the week across the northeast and New England. In the southeastern states, a chilly rain across the Gulf Coast in through Florida. A couple of snowflakes in the Tennessee Valley. A bit of a cool rain system for areas of Oklahoma and Texas. Short lived. Some snow and ice potential coming off last week's severe weather in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Uh, some severe weather potential Gulf Coast. You get that contrast of temperature readings. Here comes the cold into the Tennessee Valley, Southern Plains. Meanwhile, some showers, a couple of thunderstorms in through Florida. Cloudy, cool, chilly weather across the mid Atlantic region. Big changes ahead across the country weather wise this week. Greg Sodier is back with his extended farm weather forecast for the country presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. Well, when you do the moisture conversion, some areas are getting some very significant precipitation. Greg, let's take a look at how that map looks in the week ahead here. Max, that's right. You take all that snow, uh, you know, you wanted moisture, but perhaps not necessarily all at once. And you take that snow that we had last week across the northern plains back into the Rockies, the foothills, some of these worst drought areas of the upper Midwest, northern plains. You melt it down. There was probably an inch, inch and a half, close to two inches water equivalency for every, let's say, 10 inches of snow on average that melts down to about one inch of rain. So there is the math. So while these amounts are kind of light to modest here at a quarter to a half, inch that could be upwards of maybe four to eight inches of snow and probably two or three clipper systems to move on through parts of the plains upper Midwest and note here is the snow line where we anticipate accumulating snows into the Great Lakes region down as far south as Oklahoma back along the divide of the Pacific Northwest in this corridor and northward 
Yeah, we're going to put a healthy amount of snow on the ground here, not only in the short term, but in the medium range as well. Though these Arctic highs, these cold air masses migrate right to these uh, cold surfaces and snow covered grounds. Severe weather potential last week into this part of the country, now along the Gulf Coast again, including Florida. Some wet weather over the southeastern part of the country and some moisture as well into the Pacific Northwest parts of California. Following that cold wave weather conditions as we officially clock into the winter time season on the 21st, a little bit before four in the afternoon in the central time zone. Well, let's look ahead here into the new year between Christmas and New Year's and uh, it's not very pleasant at all. It is a cold wave weather pattern wide and far reaching across the country. Gulf Coast back along the divide. Some moderation out of the valleys of California coming off what should be this week. The likelihood of a multi day frost and freeze event all the way down into the Imperial and San Joaquin valleys, but a warm up there. The cold all the way into parts of northern Florida. Moisture wise, it'll be one afternoon other not necessarily major storms, but fast moving light to moderate clipper systems. If you put down this light amount of moisture, it's still a fluffed up uh, several inch snow event for parts of the northern and central Rockies across the plains. Many Corn Belt locales, probably some ice potential in this area. Wet weather down across the southeast will be normal back to dry time for areas of West Texas and the southwestern sections of the country and a little drier than average would you believe in the heart of that bitter cold air across the Canadian Prairie. We look ahead here into do that first full week of uh, January some moderation hate using the term warm up at all, but some moderation. The cold eases a bit across parts of the Midwest still extends through big sky country into parts of the Northeast to New England. Temperatures trying to get uh, back close to seasonal norms in this particular corridor, but then you warm it up. That means more moisture and you get this contrast of uh, temperatures in this jet stream pattern as well, where the warmth is across the southern parts of the country. Here is the precipitation pattern. It's busy. It's active. It's good news into areas of the Pacific Northwest. Hey, by the way, into those uh, Sierra ranges already twice the normal snow amount and moisture levels across those peaks of the Sierra for the month of December. Good news, but that's not the way the rest of the winter or La Nina season will continue on. Busy storm pattern for winter time across much of the Corn Belt into the Northeast and New England. Normal precipitation rainfall wise down across Florida heading uh, through and to about the mid stretch of the month of January. A little respite, some moderation in the cold, no warm up, still below average. For now, the heart of the cold air eases a bit across the St. Lawrence River Valley. It will expand again with time. Still note the uh, jet, uh, at least the buckle jet stream pattern here over the southeastern part of the country across the western states. Temperatures are above average and it could be a pretty dynamic and busy as you would expect for mid January stormy weather pattern for much of the northern Rockies, much of the plain states, the Corn Belt into the northeast. And New England. Next on This Week in Agribusiness, it's Max's Tractor Shed, spotlighting another great American tractor. Well, many of my friends with old tractors really get into the Christmas spirit and load them up with lights, take them to town and parade them. As we tell you at Max's Tractor Shed this weekend, brought to you by Store Lock Tool Cabinets. You know, you have a few days yet to get that order in before the end of the year, and they'll get that cabinet together for you. It'd be a nice thing to arrive at your place in 2023. Go to their website, storelock.com. Well, it occurred to me a few days ago that there are a lot of Christmas parades, and I've been seeing a few tractors showing up in those. I think the number is increasing dramatically year to year. I put out the call and oh my goodness, did we get a bunch of submissions such as this great looking tractor. This is Denny at Owensville, Indiana. Look at the shine of that tractor, the way that 1456 looks. Oh yeah, he put lights around the wheels. That takes a little bit of time. And here's another one, this parade in Linesville, Pennsylvania a few days ago. Look at that big bad Agco Challenger coming down the street. Well, here's one from Belvedere, Illinois, talking about big tractors. My goodness, look at that quad track with that blade across the front, ready to do some duty and moving big snows. This one's from Jefferson City, Missouri, I think, and I'm not sure what that pig is all about, but it's getting a good ride down the street just ahead of Christmas. And here's one from Ontario. I received several from Ontario, Drayton, Ontario. They decked out the sprayer, and in England, too, they do this? You bet. These British tractors were adorned with lights at Norfolk, England. Well, let's see what's moving across the block of the week ahead at Big Iron Auctions. Here's our friend Mark Stock. 
Hi Max, this DecemberBigIron.com has over 13,000 items for auction and 22 retirement sales. December 21st is auction day one with 1,857 items. December 22nd, day two, has over 1,260 items. December 27th, the end of the year auction day one has 1,900 plus items. December 28th, the day two has 2,500 items. And December 29th, we've got over 1,893 items. On December 21st, Big Iron has the Gail and Sarah Dinkelman retirement sale in Waco, Nebraska. 110 items, including a 2013 John Deere S670 Combine. On December 28th, the Bob, Clary, and Sons Retirement Sale in Harris, Texas, has 113 items, including a 2011 Challenger MT765C Track Tractor. Also on December 28th, Big Iron has the Tommy Peterson Retirement Sale in Exeter, Nebraska. They've got 70 items on the sale, including a 2000 year model John Deere 750 drill. December 29th, Big Iron will be conducting the Allen and Connie Clemens Farm Retirement Sale in Guyman, Oklahoma. 127 high quality items, including two 2021 John Deere S780 combines. Big Iron would like to thank all of our bidders, buyers, and sellers for 2022, and we wish everyone a very Merry Christmas and a very Happy New Year. See everybody in 2023. We so enjoy every week visiting with a member of the FFA, outstanding members who come across our screen here, people like Aiden Yoho, who's a freshman at Kansas State University. Aiden, it's good to see you. You're still on campus as we record this, huh? Yes, I am, and it's good to see you, and thanks for letting me on. You are the state secretary, or have served as state secretary of Kansas FFA, is that right? Yes, sir, I am the Kansas FFA state secretary. And also a star farmer in the state. Am I right about that? Yes, I was. Uh, I got star farmer and convention in June. It was a pretty great honor. It's something that I've been wanting to do my entire career in FFA, and I didn't know if it was going to happen or not because I had a smaller operation. But when my name was called, my jaw dropped, and I was. That was probably one of the best feelings of my life. Oh, it had to be exhilarating. Tell us about that smaller operation of which you speak. So I started out my freshman year with about six head of backgrounding heifers. My great grandfather has done it for about 60, 70 years, and he really wanted me to get started in it. So I bought six off of him, and then I continued up to 12. And then last year I had about 30 head of uh, steers and heifers. So kind of just a smaller operation, but I learned a lot from him. And then I also took up the family's hay operation after my grandfather passed away in 2020. Oh, you've, you've done those folks uh, proud, no doubt. Do you see whatever path you take uh, professionally, do you see yourself wanting to have some cattle around, do you think, the rest of your life? So, yes, that is my number one goal, is to be able to go back home, run the family operation while doing my career path. And what do you think your career path might be? What are you leaning toward? So, right now, probably going to do the commodity trading route. I want to be able to do the commodity trading for our own f operation as well as other people's in Southeast Kansas. But I do have uh, aspirations to be a lobbyist and do uh, work in the political field as well. So we'll see. That takes a unique individual by all means. And we know you're being well trained for that. Uh, congratulations to you on your work already on FFA. Have a great Christmas there at Yates Center, Kansas, when you get back home. A Merry Christmas to you and your family. Thank you. And Merry Christmas to you as well. Aiden Yoho, representing Kansas FFA, he's the state secretary. Well, over the past week, some of my farmer friends were putting their year-end business on the hold. They were devoting effort to something else, wreaths across America. This is the weekend that they take those beautiful wreaths into national cemeteries all across the United States. And some of my farmer friends were involved in carrying in the wreaths at Abraham Lincoln National Cemetery, just south of Chicago. Semi-trucks are not able to access those roads through that hallowed place, so a bunch of farmers in that area take their livestock trailers, pulled by their pickup trucks, to distribute those wreaths. Uh, they get a police escort and go on into the cemetery. Uh, across those some 900 plus acres of that particular cemetery where more than 3,000 veterans and spouses are buried annually, volunteers post those wreaths in a tribute to our veterans. Thanks to our friend Dave Kestel, who's helped lead that effort for many years as it expands 
each year, it seems. Well, we want to mention to you a special broadcast coming up in a couple of weekends, that Farm All 100 broadcast. As we ease into 2023, we will share with you a broadcast from the headquarters of Case IH in Wisconsin, where we visited with some folks about the heritage of the Farm All brand and what's going on with that company today. And uh, we'll be paying tribute to 100 years of Farm All. New Year's weekend, that'll be New Year's Eve morning and New Year's Day, depending on the airtime on this particular station. And then next weekend, we'll bring you our Christmas special. This week, they had that church tour in Southeast Missouri, 38 churches actually in two states and in the five counties there all together, opening their doors for the public to come in and see those houses of worship. There are some that date back, well, a couple of centuries. It's a magnificent place to visit. A lot of great farms in that area. And in addition to the agriculture, those folks uh, certainly value their faith. And we look forward to sharing the story of those churches next weekend here. That'll be our special Christmas edition of this week in agribusiness as we've uh, gone into churches for many, many years to celebrate the reason for the season. We'll see you here next week. In the meantime, have a great holiday season. So long. Closed captioning for This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Kubota. Shape your world. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Case IH. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by OMAX Communication in association with 22 Creative Group. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.